introduction. Um, thank you everyone, of course, for being here. It's so funny, yesterday my students and I were talking about how kind the winter weather has been to us, and then today it's like right. <laughs> walking in. And That's it's because you said it. I'm exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I, I do want to start off um, talking a little bit about my um, research, extended um, research. Dr. Edwards done, did a wonderful job of speaking of it. Um, and so my research is really an interdisciplinary investigation of both oral and written literacies. And it's truly inspired by um, my past experiences working with African American language speaking students over the years, and I'll talk about that a little uh, more shortly. Um, in 2003, I started working um, at an extension center for Wayne State University. And some of you might be familiar um, with the DCE McNichols Center um, before it closed down. And we worked with a lot of the local um, population of students. So great, awesome group of students that came in. They um, were dynamic, you know, students spoke really awesome, rich African American language. But one of the things I noticed is that they used it in their writing as well. And at that time, I was so ill prepared to handle this situation. I was not equipped with any pedagogies. I didn't know what to do or anything within that realm. So, um, as I was trained a little bit when I was coming um, to the to the um, extension center, I started marking some of the sentences and things of that nature that they employed in writing with African American language characteristics as improper or things of that nature. And then I started noticing another ill effect. And that was when my students started to kind of withdraw from writing overall, was not coming to class, not completing their tasks or anything of that nature, putting their head down if they were in class. And I knew it was something that I had to fix. So that was something that really inspired me to kind of look at where I am at right now with my research and where it has been. And that's with African American language at the intersection of writing practices. And with African American language, I particularly focus on urban African American, adolescent, and young adult culture. And I look at um, writing across four contexts, home, school, community, and cyberspace. And I look at that, um, again, at the intersection of writing practices. I want to see how that language intertwines with writing, if it intertwines. And I also want to examine the, the writing pedagogies we use to kind of assist these students. And I see this research as important for two primary reasons which I have here. The first is, is most importantly, that not all AAL speaking students use features of African American language and writing, but some do. And what we know is that a significant amount of that population do, so it's really important for us to have those pedagogies and curriculums that kind of assist these students when it comes to writing. And secondly, that we know that there has been, you know, a lot that's kind of been done over the years. Most importantly, we have the 1974 students write to their own language the 1979 Ann Arbor Black English case, the 1997 Oakland Ebonics Resolution, and decades of sociolinguistic and literacy research. Even though we have some of this stuff that is out there, there is a problem with teaching African American language speaking students to write that has still not been sufficiently addressed. So this is what kind of inspires me and motivates me to continue on with the research um, that I have been working with. And this latter point really does um, extend to a larger, long-standing problem that has been prevalent within writing studies. And that problem is the deficit approaches to teaching writing to African American language speaking students. So deficit approaches identifies African American language speaking students' oral and written literacies as deficits, showing deficiencies. So instead of recognizing it as, yes, this is a legitimate language, it's identified as improper, incorrect, or anything within that context. So the goal of the deficit approaches and perspectives are generally to correct, help students correct and change that language. And what we do know about deficit approaches is a few things, and I highlight just two here. One is that deficit approaches negatively affect AAL speaking students' oral and written literacy development. So again, it causes them oftentimes to disengage from wanting to even write or wanting to be a part of the, the classroom. Secondly, is that it negatively affects AAL speaking students' overall writing performance. And one of the key things is this characteristic here is identified as one of the contributing factors for the national writing performance gap between African American language students, particularly those who use African American language uh, features within writing and success. So we got that gap that's there. And according to NAEP, 
173 on that scale that they use is considered proficient on the 12th grade NA, NAEP writing exam. And of all of the races that are identified, black students are identified the lowest. And again, what the statistics are showing from Smitherman and Appleby and Langer and the other work is that when those features of African American language are prevalent, those students are scored lower. So this is really a problem that, um, that's in need of being addressed. So before I, want to, before I go any further with things, I do want to introduce Kendrick and just show some of the things that he has done. So Kendrick is an African-American male, and he's from an urban, predominantly African-American neighborhood. And he is certainly a speaker of African-American language. He's got a lot of charisma and things of that nature. And he actually likes school. So those are some things that he um, identified. And Kendrick, at the moment, is in his freshman year of college. But we had the opportunity to explore some of his writing that he produced over the years. And in particular, we had the opportunity to look at one that he had evaluated as well. So in the 11th grade, um, Kendrick wrote his English paper on the topic on the qualities of a characteristic of a best friend. And this was a two-page double-spaced paper. Um, and he, he really enjoyed talking about his best friend, Dante, within this um, written assignment. So here I just have some of the expressions used by Kendrick and some of the characteristic features of the AAL that explains that expression. So the first one was Dante be trying to. So that's something that he used when he was trying to really explain what Dante tries to do, you know, when they are um, together, some of the things when they, and then particular in this essence is when they were at an arcade. And what this expression um, refers to is the habitual B, and that's the use of an unafflicted B in African American language. So of course, not a grammatical mistake or error, it's, it's a habitual B characteristic of AAL and chilling in the, and so when he was talking about their home and, and what they do when they're in the house, he used this phrase which is characteristic of black semantics. So we know that African American language speakers use a lot of those rhetorical moves and those semantics as well. And thirdly, we don't do or say nothing, which is characteristics of a multiple negation. So again, this is something that um, is a characteristic of, of AAL, and that just means more than one negative in a clause, right? So after looking at his two-page double space assignment sheet, I kind of um, looked at some of the things that were there, and I noticed that his teacher, um, a white male, identified nine of the 15 areas where Kendrick used features of Af African American language as grammar areas. And the analysis that I used was the Black English Variable Scales and the Black Discourse <coughs> Scale by Smitherman, which looks at the um, grammatical linguistics of AAL, as well as the rhetorical and semantic type of features as well. So that, this was one thing that I noticed, um, which of course is problematic because that's more than half was identified um, as an error, although it was characteristics of AAL. So experiences like these is what um, inspires Kendrick to have some of these thoughts that he had. And this is a little bit on identity and writing and performance. When I asked Kendrick a little bit about that, he talked about some of these things here. Firstly, I ain't a good writer. I need to learn how to write correct. So this is one of the negative attitudes that he already had. <coughs> my writing always been criticized by my teachers and I got to be on a paper twice in high school, but I usually get C's, D's, and F's. And Kendrick even indicated that some of the F's came from just not submitting his assignments, just because of, again, um, his, um, his disengagement from writing and then from the classroom. And when I asked Kendrick about his motivation to write, was he motivated to write in the classroom, outside the classroom, or anything, and I asked him to kind of categorize it if it's low, medium, or high, he indicated low, because it's something that just, again, he just wanted to refrain from, especially within school context. So these experience and knowledge led me to commit, consider the following set of questions. So these two questions I have here. First, why do deficit approaches to teaching and writing to AAL speaking students exist? And secondly, what can we do to counter these approaches? Firstly, when I did a little bit of research and background on this, um, especially number one, why do they exist? I found three key areas. Number one was the unconscious negative attitudes toward African American language. So what was noted is that a lot of teachers just 
weren't conscious of what African American language is, and they had those negative attitudes toward it. So again, that's kind of like a replica of what I was doing when I first started teaching. I had no idea what it was, and my move forward was to just correct it. Secondly, it was a lack of an awareness that kind of goes into the first of what I was stating too, of African American language. And thirdly, lack of ped pedagogies. And so that's the gap between research and practice. So we have some of the scholarship out there that states that there is the gap and there needs to be pedagogies that help teachers to understand what it is uh, when it comes to characteristics of AAL and how to teach these students as well. So how do we counter these approaches? Critical language awareness has been one of the recent identified um, forms of ways to counter, counter deficit approaches. So using critical language pedagogy has been um, used kind of throughout for international and national purposes when it comes to second language students and things of that nature. And that has been one characteristic for um, thinking toward countering those approaches for AAL speaking students as well. And so for critical language awareness, it's an approach geared toward providing insight to the cultural, social, and historical aspects of language at the intersection of power, and as such, aims to assuage negative perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors held by both learners and teachers. So this is why this is one of the ones identified as the thing that can counter those deficit perspectives, because there are negative behaviors on the learners and the teachers' part that need to be assuaged. And it's also an essential component to any second language, oral, and or written education system. And its importance arises from the need to develop an understanding of and respect for the diversity and language use patterns and dialects across cultures and ethnic groups as well. So that is kind of some of the um, key things for CLA um, in its, its background there. So for the rest of the presentation, I do want to um, go through some of these key points. So I want to discuss my current research project, which is a critical language intervention with one English instructor and several AAL speaking students in college preparatory English courses. So I took up that call there for critical language awareness to see if this is an approach that really is needed for these students. Does it work? Second, I want to describe how the major implications of this research project impact some of the theoretical, methodological, and practice-oriented understandings for sustaining, which is really important, and enhancing, which is moving them to that level they need to be, the writing of AAL speaking students specifically and culturally and linguistically diverse students more generally. And then my hope is at the end is that there's enough time for both Q&A and to kind of share ideals for some um, culturally sustaining pedagogies that can be for culturally and linguistically diverse students. So both of those. So moving forward, taking up that aim, so to address the issue of deficit approaches to teaching writing to AAL speaking students, my current research project does take up that call for CLA, right? And it asks this integral question, does teaching that pays special attention to critical language awareness enhance the writing experiences and outcomes of AAL speaking students and composition courses? So this was my aim, I wanted to see if this could be used to get them, you know, to have them feel comfortable with them, their language and their writing, and to move them to where they need to be at. To address this question, I look toward an interdisciplinary conceptional framework. And so these are some of the um, identities that I use. First, linguistic properties of African American language. This kind of talks about the structures and use of African American language along with the importance of identifying it uh, with the pedagogies. Secondly, sociocultural perspectives of writing, which of course talks about the writing process overall and the importance of it, but associating that within social context as well. Third, of course, critical language instructional um, approaches, so thinking about how those can be intertwined to, again, assuage those negative attitudes and perceptions and kind of guide us toward moving um, those, this population of students toward success. And then fourth, criti teacher critical language awareness. And this is more so for the teacher who I recruited and I prepared for um, implementing the set of uh, pedagogical material that I developed. So I use some of the guides here for uh, the critical language awareness. So for this, I want to, rest of the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about more so uh, the series of uh, pedagogical material I developed. 
I wish I did have time to talk about the teacher preparation program because that was significant itself. The two-day program, it, I mean, it was so awesome. I wish I had time to talk about all of this, but I don't. So um, as far as the pedagogical material, it is supplementary. So with that in mind, um, the goal here was not to just change the existing curriculums in pedagogy and composition. That was by far not the goal. It was to supplement it and thereby provide like a culture and linguistic inclusion. So think about it within those texts. So that's kind of more what um, the goal was here. And the series of pedagogical material focused on four primary elements um, that we have identified here. Sociolinguistic variation. So when we started this study, this was one of the things that we um, started and worked out and we discussed an overview of reference to African American language, myths versus reality, and then we moved on to um, the difference with that in standard American English. And this was a key component because again, a lot of the students had negative attitudes and some of them weren't even aware that they were just using it. You know, so this was really instrumental in you know, helping them to understand this is what African American language is, this is the features, this is what's a reality, and this is a myth, because it's not a bad English, it's not, a, it's not broken, it's a legitimacy there. Um, second, language identity and writing, and this was more of where we did some analyzing, we theorized around writing, and we looked specifically at writing um, that had features of African American language throughout. So, of course, we looked at some June Jor and his song Where, that's um, in African American language from beginning to end. We looked at writing that was all in standard American English, and we looked at writing that cold meshed as well. So we, for that one, we looked a lot within Geneva Smitherman and um, Elaine Richardson's work that does cold mesh as well. And so this helps students to understand, to kind of identify, you know, what those writing um, it looked like and, and how it's kind of um, intertwined and things of that nature. Third, plan with discourse patterns. This is probably the participants' favorite um, project here. This was multi-genre writing. It was a tough one because they really had to critically think about this. And for this, they had to do writing that was completely in African American language, one that was completely in standard American English, and one that was cold meshing. And this really helped them to really critically think about moves that they had to make when they had to write these certain things. And so um, they had to really think about topic, audience, purpose, and writing style. We'll talk about that a little bit more um, soon. And last, it was a linguistic discrimination project. And this is where they reflect about language and power. Um, for this project, we actually was not able to get through the entire thing because of so much conversation about this. And they realized how much they even discriminated about against other people uh, when certain languages were being used as well. So this was. Um, a really insightful project there. And for each of these projects, as we did go along, um, it was certainly aligned with contemporary writing instruction, um, going with the goals of writing, reading, and reflection throughout. So each time that we did a project, those were things that we did. We read, we wrote, and we reflected on things of that nature. A little bit about the research context. I mean, it was, it's, it was at a public urban research university situated in a large Midwestern city, case study. Um, and I recruited, um, yeah, I guess we can guess where that's at. So it's always weird when I have to say that, which is so funny. <laughs> but it's like, I have to say it that way. It's like, yeah, I guess you can guess where that happened. <laughs> so um, I recruited again one English instructor and several AAL speaking students in college preparatory English courses. And then for the study, there were two, 10 young women who participated and six young men. And all self-identified as African American, and they also identified as speakers of African American language sometimes in the study as well. So this is just a little bit of overview of those participants. In the data collection, collection and analysis, again, this is just for the student participants. Um, before the critical language intervention, I did a pre-writing assessment, and then I did a pre-attitudinal assessment as well. So that's where I kind of was able to gauge, you know, some of their attitudes and things and see where their writing was at at the beginning. Implementation of the critical language intervention is a series of supplemental pedagogical material that I had developed, as well as field notes and artifacts. So that's kind of what occurred, like, throughout. And immediately after, I did a post-writing assessment, um, um, and, or I should say what was administered was a post-writing assessment, a post-attitudinal assessment, and an exit interview as well. And this content was analyzed by the Discourse Analysis Method, discussed in 2011. So here are some of just some of the initial
initial findings um, before, so the pre-writing assessment, <clears throat> excuse me. So for the pre-writing assessment, again, using the Geneva Smitherman's heuristic work for those assessments, um, one of the things I noticed is that the students did use, you know, AAL traditions, um, so that was kind of prevalent in secondary concern, writing unity and coherence. So what I mean by that, it seems like that was at the backdrop and that wasn't something that students were attending to in the writing. The pre-attitude assessments, again, um, some of the negative things that were noted here, but for First and foremost, um, the students did consider AAL a linguistic resource a little bit within their everyday lives. Again, that's across those communities, cyberspace, um, and things of that nature. Face negative consequences when using AAL with the emphasis on written at school. That was some a key feature that I noted. And held negative attitudes about AAL. So some of the things that I saw was like bad, slang, ghetto, incorrect, wrong way. When I asked, you know, about AAL, what are your thoughts about it? So I do want to return to Kendrick. So we looked at him a little bit earlier, but back to Kendrick and a little bit of some of the content that he produced throughout the study. Again, I wish I could talk about all the students, but um, just one. So right here, this is a little bit of the preliminary writing prompt. And I wanted the students to get a little bit more of something that they were doing within um, their preparatory composition course, some of the summary and response modes within there. So I had them to read a little short passage from June Jordan, compose a summary and response, and then to talk a little bit about, you know, the appropriateness and to provide a brief rationale. Because here again, I wanted to also get more a little bit about their attitudes um, and see, you know, what I needed to find there and how I could make adjustments if needed for those pedagogies. And so this is Kendrick's summary and response in his ranking. So he has here, and this is the beginning of his um, writing. Right off the bat, I noticed that the F in the first isn't capitalized. So that put me in an offset mood. And he continues on with this passage is extremely in inappropriate and things of that nature. So we kind of see throughout that um, there's a negative attitude there. And also that there isn't really a frame for writing. So he just goes right into the no unity or coherence there. Um, and things of that nature. So it goes back to some of the data set um, I was discussing a little bit earlier. And his ranking was not appropriate as he indicated right here within the passage itself. And right after the pre-assessment, so going into that first week after the pre-assessment content, we talked a little bit about sociolinguistic variation, again, African American language, myths versus realities, and standard American English and things of that nature. So the overview of what is African American language, is it incorrect, improper, broken English, and we looked at it from the oral and written um, context. So we kind of explored different literature within that, again, fluent from Smitherman, um, Kirkland, Richardson, and more from that. So after we did this sociolinguistic variation project, um, Kendrick responded with, I didn't know that was a legitimate speech form. I didn't know authors use this, and I think it should be preserved. So we can see after he's kind of looking at um, some of the, the logistics of African American language and what makes it up, that he's starting to recognize and, and identify with some of the characteristics that's there. And this helped establish the foundation for the rest of the study throughout. Because once we had the opportunity to kind of break down and look more closely at AAL and then SAE for the end of that, we were able to kind of use that as a foundation to get moving with some of the other things that we were doing. And it aligns with the critical language awareness approach, which asks us to do critical reading and writing. And what that means is that for when we approached each of our writing tasks for each of those projects, we looked very carefully and thought about things such as the topic, audience, purpose, and writing style. So we, before that, we kind of looked at some of the readings, of course, to kind of identify how those most was made up, and we used that as a heuristic. So I asked students to think about those natures of what is going to be your topic, who's your audience, who's your purpose, and what is going to be your writing style. And the writing style also always had to fit those modes of audience and, and topic and purpose and things of that nature. So that was kind of one of the um, foundations throughout. Skipping over some of the data, of course, because I know this is a, you know, a lot of data heavy there, um, I want to go to Kendrick's post-writing prompt. So after we did uh, complete and go through some of those, those four projects, or go through all of those four projects, 
Uh, we have the opportunity to do the post-writing prompts and evaluate that. So one thing that I noted was that Kendrick's preliminary writing prompt <coughs> word count was 104, and his post-writing prompt word count was 260. So of course, it's too long to kind of even put on the PowerPoint here. So he kind of really got into the ambiance of writing. And using those um, structures of thinking about writing and the topic, the purpose, the audience, and writing style in those mode, we can see that Kendricks picks this up when he starts to write. And this is the beginning of his experts, where he talks about June Jordan's argues that. Looking at some of the things that we did and, and completed throughout the study, he critically thought about those modes of, again, how to start things within the writing process and things of that orientation and nature. This was interesting because when I talked to Kendrick a while after re looking at this, I you know, told him that I honestly didn't think that his writing was actually bad in the beginning. Maybe he was just disengaged, because that was just my theory, because it was just interesting the, the, the difference that I could see within this. And one of the things that Kendrick did admit that before this, he did um, just complete assignments quickly, writing assignments, because his thought was that he was going to get a low grade on it anyway. But after he had to start thinking about those critical things, such as topic, audience, writing, um, and purpose, writing style, I'm sorry, and purpose, then he began to understand a little bit about what those things that he needs to do as a writer, what's the importance of using AAL, SAE, when to use it, when to code match, and things of that nature. So his attitude uh, from the post um, attitudinal assessment kind of shifted a little bit too. So one of the things that I noted was that he did have an improved attitude about AAL. So it was no longer like this, it was it's bad or it's incorrect, something that I shouldn't do. Improved attitude about writing. So it wasn't something that he just disliked doing. It was something that he was interested in engaging with. He believed he had a better understanding of how to write um, after um, the inter intervention was put into play. And he believed as a result, his overall writing had some improvement. At the end, one of the things that he stated when he walked out, because again, Kendrick had such a vibrant attitude, was why can't writing be taught like this for real? Okay, so he, um, again, within his data, entered, um, at, admitted that he enjoyed some of the things and some of the other data results show that um, before the study, he indicated that he was introduced to African American readings twice. And that was on the Zora Neale Hurston was one of those readings. Um, and Toni Morrison was the second within high school. And so after this, now that we looked more, it was like a wow moment for him as far as I didn't realize that there was other African-American authors that were even out there. So what the data did show um, overall, looking at it from the heuristic, is that clear, cri um, critical language awareness does have the potential to enhance AAL speaking students' writing experiences and outcomes because it provides them with that structure and that foundation for their writing. And in particular, when they have to start to critically think about the moves they, they are making. But first and most importantly, it has to start with a sociolinguistic variation overview so students can start to understand um, some of those structures and modes of language and how it is used and picked up. So this was a quick glance of, of the data. The data, again, was very heavy. There's a lot of data there's included. Um, so that's just, just a little bit of touch, probably 1% of the data that is there. But what it does show is that cultivating successful writing experiences and outcomes for culturally and linguistically diverse students kind of starts with some of these approaches here. For writing teachers, it is important to readjust the attitudes because when those negative attitudes are held, it gets translated to the students and they start to pick it up and start thinking that their language and writing is bad and they begin to disengage and we want them to engage with writing. Secondly, to confront linguistic insecurities and prejudice. Sometimes, again, we have those unconscious insecurities and prejudice when it comes to language. Um, so if that's kind of confronted and addressed, then that could be a thing that, of course, will help this population of students. Welcome to the social and linguistic reality. So for example, to bring diverse readings in, um, it was just astounding that for Kendrick, before, within high school, there was just two, two African American readings that he was introduced to. Um, so diverse readings is very much important in artifacts that replicate the students. So we looked at some hip hop in, and the rap within this as well, so some things that are characteristics of students. And I also had students, some of the participants brought in things from their own home, so I thought that that was really fascinating as well. 
create opportunities for students to play multiple roles in writing. And that goes to um, that multi general activity where students were able to write within those different categories of AAL, Standard American English, and the code meshing as well. And reimagine the writing conference. And that just means that we're having the writing conference with our students that we kind of ask them about what is your purpose um, and to see if the, the affiliated writing style matches that. Because everything doesn't have to be written in Standard American English, of course, um, especially if that's not what the topic calls for. So for example, in the past, I had a student write a discourse community paper on the hip hop culture in Detroit. That calls for code meshing, and that's OK. And we have to allow that room for that. Writing teacher preparation, and this is pre-service and in-service. Interdisciplinary perspectives are very important. So include an interdisciplinary approach to their rise and prepare writing teachers to teach writing to culturally and linguistically diverse students. And secondly, prepare writing teachers to engage all students in critical language pedagogies in order to offset assumptions that perpetuate linguistic discrimination at all levels. And that's for both the learner and the teacher. Here are some of the helpful resources that I found when I first began you know, um, my study. Of course, there are um, more that are out there, but African American Literacy by um, Elaine Richardson, that's kind of one that's profound. African American Literacy is Unleashed, Vernacular English and the Composition Classroom by Lardner and Ball. A Teacher's Introduction to African American English, What a Writing Teacher Should Know by Weber Reed. And Language Diversity in the Classroom from Intention to Practice. So these are four um, that kind of set the foundation for me. And there's a lot more out there. Um, of course, that I, I used throughout the study, but this was kind of the foundation. So again, as I indicated, I didn't want to get too data heavy because that could get too, <laughs> too in intensive. So I wanted to kind of step back and leave room for either Q&As or for us to even talk and circulate and think about ideas when it comes to um, culturally sustaining pedagogies and things of that nature. So I think I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Writing unity and coherence. Oh, I'm sorry. What is that? So, writing unity and coherence <coughs> is making sure that the writing kind of is united from the beginning to end. And I just put secondary concern because it appeared from the data <coughs> that I was analyzing that it was something that the students weren't even focusing on. So, um, looking at Kendrick's post um, writing, you can see that he started off within. Um, June Jordan's piece, and he started to kind of set the foundation of describing what he was summarizing first. Uh -huh. But within his pre, he just went right for the response. So there was like no type of unity or coherence within that either. Mm -hmm. So it, for me, the data set um, indicated that it was just a little bit of a secondary concern there and not something that the students were thinking about at the beginning. So they weren't thinking strategically about their writing. And for when um, for my write-up, one of the things that I've indicated um, with that was just the lack of foundation for thinking about the topic for the purchase audience and, and writing style for that. Okay. And they're just going to write into it. Mm -hmm. So thank you for asking me that because the idea mm -hmm. that secondary concern is possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I don't know how to frame this mm -hmm. um, because so much of what you talk about seems to me to be contingent on in a lot of things. But mm -hmm. I guess that one of the most glaring ones is kind of a, a shift in the level of awareness of instructors. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. That's not small, you know, yes. and it's. I don't see that on a, you know, I'm talking about now right. here at mm -hmm. Wayne. And so on a university level, I don't really see that. Mm -hmm. You know, that would have to be like a micro function. You mm -hmm. know, oh, you handle that in your department, you handle that, you know, in your classroom, or you handle that in your own mind. Mm -hmm. Use your judgment. Mm -hmm. So when we use our judgment, we're making comments to students, and it seems like what you're saying is 
even in, you know, when I get a, a paper in, a work, a test, you know, from the student, because now I'm starting to think of beyond just the paper, right. you know what I'm saying? So when I respond to that student, and, you know, there's a relationship that happens here, mm -hmm. you're saying that I have the ability in my response to affirm that person's cultural experience. I don't even right. think we're aware of that. Exactly. So that goes back to the part. Um, so again, I didn't have the time to talk about my teacher data set. Yes. So, <laughs> Help the teacher. So yes. Yeah, so the teacher <laughs> data set. Let me go to teacher critical language awareness. So this was a two-day preparation program, and I, I recruited um, English teachers for this. So I selected an English teacher who specifically, because um, I wanted to see again if this would work. She had negative attitudes toward African American language um, within herself, and so again, I wanted to develop that preparation program. The first day of that preparation program was all about the um, structure of African American language. So we sat down, we went over what that looks like and things of that nature. Her data indicated same thing. Wow, I didn't even know that this was just a legit. So I was actually correcting these as mistakes when I didn't know it. Yes. So it goes to the importance. That's really so important, those um, critical language awareness, those preparation programs, because mm -hmm. most teachers don't know. I didn't know when I started, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was the same thing. The mm -hmm. second day we went over, um, I gave her a set of books, and then we also went over the actual, um, and that goes to the supplementary pedagogical material she was going to implement. Sure. And I also gave her, for participating, um, some of the pedagogy guys that I use within the classroom as well. So that kind of helped her set up the foundation. At the end of the study, um, she indicated <coughs> within um, her data set that it was just, that was the most, more than her getting the curriculum material from me, the teacher language awareness was the most important. Because without her, that, this would have meant nothing. So it's so important to have that there. The fifth week of the study, she even cried at the end of the study when the students walked out because the students talked about how um, the teachers were always criticizing. And she said, that was me. And I told her, I said, that was me too. I had to hug her and said, that was me too. That was me too at the same time. So that was another part of the study that I think is instrumental because it's, it's a twofold thing. You have to prepare teachers. It's, it, it, you have to. Because even though those pedagogies are here too, what, what does it mean if we don't even know what the structure looks like? So we have the teacher right here who was making these corrections. And this was me when I first started off teaching too. And, and just because I, I believe, I truly believe, and I didn't have a conversation with the teacher, but I truly believe the teacher just didn't know. So there is such a need for those pre-service and in-service programs, I totally agree, um, for that awareness. Yeah, and, and beyond even, you know, just this population, mm -hmm. right? I'm just looking That's across right. the board at some other populations. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. wow. So you have to look for my books. So I have two books coming out. One okay. with the teacher okay. <laughs> okay. development and the other one with the um, cool. student and data, just because, I mean, there, it really is so important. And Marcel Haddix has a new book out on this too. Racial and linguistic Marcel Haddix, cultivating racially and linguistic diversity mm -hmm. within teacher preparation. So I was speaking to her, and I told her, "I said, you taking some of my data." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I I totally agree with you. I mean, that's that's really important at the forefront. Yeah. One of the things that we've been talking about in the department is. And it might be kind of like a dual line running through this, and Kendrick seemed to kind of make the point. You know, the, my question was, how much of this is also about reading? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had talked about that. And so it, even in my classes, I'm thinking about, you know, like the, the graduate culture class that I teach. Mm -hmm. We look at hip-hop culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we read academic writing on hip-hop, but we also read hip-hop lyrics. Mm -hmm. And the lyrics are more closely aligned to what you're talking about. And we talk about people's lived experience and authenticity, you know, in the writing, owning, you know, the work, that this is my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I can see, you know, this kind of affirming of, of a person's identity. But I, I, I just wonder if, because I've even heard from students, you know, who have come about, you know, when I turn in my work, I'm getting all, you know, criticized. Mm -hmm. And so many of them are at the point where they feel like they should just drop out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't know how to fix that. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, but yeah. I think if some have said, I wonder if we could read this, or 
in my class, we don't have anything that speaks to this. Mm -hmm. Or another one said, I don't see myself in anything mm -hmm. that has been presented to me in class. Mm -hmm. So they feel like the work that is put in front of them is not culturally, you know, it's not multifaceted. It, yeah. It's one kind of, or two, <laughs> you know, in some instances, ways of being. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really see themselves. Mm -hmm. So actually, you're hitting on multiple things here that I, you know. That's, that's important, that, that really is. For this, um, we looked at David Kirkland's The Skin We Ink, as well as books by Coase, mm -hmm. um, which was, I mean, it opened up the students' eyes. They were like, wow, why can't we have this reading here? Sure. And that kind of speaks to um, when I'm teaching, you know, the writing courses here. Mm -hmm. We use that as well when we're talking about literacy narratives. Mm -hmm. When we talk about how tattoos are a form of literacy, mm -hmm. and then we associate that too with graffiti and things of that nature. That opens the door wide up for them to start to engage immediately, and, and then they can start associating what literacy means. Because one of the things I noticed, like um, in the past, is when I talked about literacy, you're like, what is literacy? Right. But when you introduce it that way, they get it. They mm -hmm. instantly get it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it is. It's important to bring those diverse readings that they can really relate to. Otherwise, they're like, they're, they're just going to again disengage. But I love I do I love your comment. I thank you for saying that about the importance of preparation. That's 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 the key thing here. And I think that's what my teacher data set says the same thing. That preparation is a big, mm -hmm. big thing. So, it's okay. Shanika, I can see, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can have a little bit about how you might scale your findings uh, across the course. So, like, you are you know, many or multiple sections of the course. So I see how the teacher preparation part, it's mm -hmm. fairly easy to scale. Right? Mm -hmm. But you're working outside of the classroom. Mm -hmm. with, with students that you recruited. Um, I can see how the readings and such could be integrated right into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But you didn't work with, so you only worked with self-identified AL speakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense for obvious reasons for how yeah, the yeah. sentence is mm -hmm. But if you integrated this into just a, just a every class, every right. section mm -hmm. of every like, first year writing course, mm -hmm. how would you handle that? Like how would that be integrated into the, into the general curriculum? Mm -hmm. I think just integrating the readings I think would itself be Right. Fantastic change, yeah. but how would that change, like how you would set it up? Right. So I talk about this in my um, dissertation, and I'll go back to the slide. The here we go. So um, one of the things that I talk about is actually scaling back, so it's not so all African American centered content, and that is culturally diverse. So instead, when we're doing the um, social linguistic variation overview, it's not just African American language; it's the other languages. Well, so inviting that conversation in there um, as well. When we did discuss for this project linguistic discrimination, we looked at Ball's work in a Dateline special that talked about linguistic discrimination as well um, amongst Asian American culture. And the students were um, one of the things they indicated was, I do that same thing with that, you know, uh, yeah, cultural yeah, thing. So yeah. that data set really made me realize the importance too of them wanting to even um, learn about other languages yeah. as well. So this was something um, that I talked about within my dissertation. Um, so secondly, the language identity and writing, where, when there's an analyze and a theorize in writing, again, it's not just AAL and SAE. Um, you might look at Azadula or things of that nature. So you're inviting other modes in. So this was in um, a particular focus on the um, African American language because of the, the target population that I'm trying to address for that um, gap between you know the writing and success is the AAL speaking students and writers. But um, certainly it would have to be scaled differently so that it can um, welcome other students, especially if it's in those pluralistic communities. This would work if it was just strictly like urban African American, but it, it certainly does. Thank you for asking that, because yeah, I, yeah, I had to write true. about that in my dissertation, yeah. the importance of it. Can you pull out for a minute and kind of in relation to academic writing, mm -hmm. put your work in com conversation with that. You know, how, how, how can the two walk alongside one another? Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me that there will be an obvious reality that we have to say that mm -hmm. this, is the, this is true. 
that we will have a population of students who will come from this experience. Mm -hmm. And not just, you know, the AAL, but there's multiple yes. lived experiences that they would come to. And then here they are in an environment where we must talk, you know, help them with academic writing and help them to become more skilled in, you know, relating their ideas and things academically to a, you know, particular audience, maybe a smaller audience, but, you know, to a particular audience. How do you put, you know, kind of, and I guess if you could look at what's the takeaway, you know, mm -hmm. what you have found, how do you put that in conversation with what we have to right. do mm -hmm. with ac preparing them for academic writing? Mm -hmm. Honestly. Can so the two I, walk together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the, I think the bigger question here is, does everything have to be written in academic writing? Mm -hmm. Especially when you're looking across the discipline and they're talking about preparing students to be speakers and writers for international purposes. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a bigger, larger question here. Um, the key thing is to prepare students to write in academic, to prepare them to be prepared for writing in academic writing, but to prepare, be prepared to write in other modes as well. And I think that's where the, the second one comes into play when we're starting to look at those modes of writing. Writing that's an African American language, writing that's an SAE, and writing that's code Because within that, we started to look and dissect what's the topic here, what's the part, and we did that with the readings out as well. So what's the topics here, what's the audience, what's the writing style, so what's the purpose of it? So we thought about that within context, because if you have to do a research paper, for example, mm -hmm. on um, a marketing department. Right. You can't use, you have to use academic writing or, or standard American English for those right. features. Right. So we start to break it down within that context. And for me, and some of the things that we discussed within here, everything does not have to be in academic writing. You have to know it, you certainly have to know it, but not everything has to be written within that mode. Mm -hmm. okay. So if that makes sense within the, um, things that we were working through within that. So once we did the overview, secondly, we kind of broke that down. Certainly, they and that was emphasized. You have to know this is important to know. Um, but um, there, is a, there is a time where you can stray away, depending on what you are going to be writing about. And that stray away to code meshing, or AAL, has a good legitimate purpose if you're writing for this topics or things of that nature. And even looking at Kendrick's pre and post, you can see that he starts to even critically think about um, the orientation of, okay, this is what I'm writing, and this is how I'm writing. And he had characteristics of African American language tradition in it within his post, but it was yeah. less than right. his pre, right. because right. he started to become conscious now that he's aware of the language differences that are there. So it sounds like one of the ways we approach this, for example, with our graduate classes, um, is that we talk to people about that there are different styles of writing, mm -hmm. and there are different audiences. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, a paper in my course, you're going to be writing for something that's going to show up in a journal. Mm -hmm. And this is the style of writing as opposed to the message that says you're getting it wrong. But say, for this audience, for this topic, yeah. this is the style of writing we use. But it also sounds like we need to be able to have conversations about what are the topics and what are the audiences where academic writing may not be the most appropriate that something else is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I don't think some of us know what yeah. something else is. I, I think that's yeah. true. You when I think of our career, give I me five true. other examples yeah. Yeah. of other kinds of writing. Mm -hmm. You know what? I would know. I don't even know if I could give yeah. you five. I know that I would say poetry. You know, mm -hmm. would be okay. one. Right. You know, I would say maybe autoethnography. You know, mm -hmm. would be another where I have writing. seen. You know, style. Mm -hmm. And I, I might say, you know, business writing, report writing. Mm -hmm. You know, but we don't think like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we just think. No, this is wrong. You know, you have to say it this way. Yes, this is that's right. right. That's We're preparing right. you to publish in journals. You can't write yeah. like this. No. But we look at yeah. students who, I mean, not students, but um, Geneva Spitherman has published successfully using code matching approach. So we looked at, it doesn't necessarily mean that you just have to write this certain way to get it done. But you can successfully publish in other ways as well, whether it's straight academic or whether it is a code matching approach. Right. So that's the kind of stuff that we, we look at as well, to okay. junction with it as, as well. Okay. So um, language from intention to practice really goes deep within that. Yeah. We had time to look at uh, one slide toward the end of that book um, through the study that talks a little bit of breaking that down a little bit from that um, whole mesh into academic writing and things of okay. that nature. And that's a really resourceful book, a really okay. resourceful book for teachers as well. So that's one of the things that is noted because it, it doesn't, 
technically mean that to be a successful writer, everything has to be an academic writer. Right? Mm -hmm. Because there's some published pieces that are, are just not. Mm -hmm. uh, Richardson's work uh, does some code meshing as well as others. Mm -hmm. we, see, we see that. Okay. Okay. Thinking about, um, as a white instructor, thinking about maintaining a safe and inclusive environment in my classroom. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I teach first year writing with Shanika. Okay. So I thought about you know trying to do a critical language unit or project in my course, but then and this is a situation that's uh, that's common and certainly not uncommon at Wayne where um, you have students of color or students who speak African American language be a numerical <coughs> minority within the classroom. Um, and so you want to talk about this, but you don't want them to be uncomfortable, um, especially, right, it's like, so, you know, you don't want to say, oh, so is this right, can you tell us more, but, you know, that sort of thing. So making sure that that space is, is safe and inclusive, um, particularly as a white instructor. Um, so I'm wondering what you would say to white instructors who teach in that situation, who, um, to make sure that the classroom is inclusive and safe. Uh, um, so I just, I'm interested, interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, because it really is important to make sure that it, yeah, it is a, a safe and inclusive environment. So one of the things that I would suggest is early on to talk about that you guys want to be dealing with those different modes within the classroom. Language, diversity, culture, religion, so that they are prepared for those aspects. So when, for me, when I get into African American language, it is it's a shift within the classroom because again, I, I find that when students are there, some of them aren't, they don't know what it is and they're like, what it is. So I always state the um, class period before, next class, this is what we're going to talk about. So that gives them some time to, if you can do a little bit of research on this fabulous and not fabulous, and then I give them a little excerpt from Richardson as well. So when they come, they're all prepared to do this. And so this is what all of the students have at the same time. So when we do engage in the conversation when they do come back to the classroom, it's they're already prepared for this and, and a little bit comfortable to talk about it. And so we talk about you know language borrowing and things of that nature because the excerpt they had has this in it um, and things of that orientation as well. So that kind of helps too when you bring up that these are things that we're going to talk about um, in the beginning so that you know students are aware and that you prepare them a class period ahead. Um, in the past, I've done it where I just did it on the spot, mm -hmm. that class, and that just didn't work. So <laughs> no I had to do that preparation so I guess they can kind of like get comfortable and then when it was time to come in. Um, and I found that even that my white students were even a little bit comfortable with this too. So we explored James Baldwin, um, if black English isn't a language, and tell me what is. Um, and my white students were even more interactive in the discussion about that than my African American students. Because of, you know, it was that preparation before with it as well. well that would be my other concern, because I've had conversations in the classroom where all of a sudden all the white students want to talk about this topic and students of color will shut down. Okay. So they, wow. again their perspectives kind of get silenced. Mm -hmm. And as every you know, it's like some of the white students want to show that like, yeah, I'm yeah. Well, happy to have this conversation, but it's like, yeah. okay, but now you're talking a lot now. Yeah. You know? So it's, it can be really, it's, it can be really dicey. Yeah. And then even if you also ask them a, another thing is to, you know, when you bring in with conversation of that, if they can bring like artifacts from home, if they have. Sure. So you can just yeah. have the yeah, item. What if you have yeah. artifacts or things of that nature? Yeah. And so I leave it open like that. I had a student who one time came in with a Facebook post. And I didn't even think about that, but he brought in a print out of a Facebook mm -hmm. post that he was using and it was a conversation he was having with a friend but he considered that like a, you know, mm -hmm. um, what did he say, this is an informal type of artifact yeah. of the language yeah. things of that to, to bring them in. Mm -hmm. So, it is, it's, 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 it's yeah. giving us different ways to think about what we do every day. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's, it's hard for my work um, just because I think it's so important and even with um, Thomas, what you're mentioning, that's so important. And it's, it all, it goes right back to preparation. So we gotta prepare teachers to be comfortable. I even had a uh, teacher say that, like, I'm just, as a white female, I'm not comfortable getting into doing that. I, how do I just start off? And so even those steps to get you to feel comfortable, because everybody don't feel comfortable just jumping in and doing this. So how can you take baby steps with this too? So that, that preparation is so, so important. 
Um, could you just elaborate a little bit on code bashing and what that looks like? Because you know, the way in contrast to code switching, yeah, which is it's right. complicated enough as it is, <laughs> to mesh the two is a very, very um, intricate yeah. um, linguistic yeah. um, like, you know skill yeah. to have. Mm -hmm. So if you could just you know elaborate on what that looks like in comparison to a you know standard American English writing sample versus um, a Black American um, language sample, just looking at. Mm -hmm. The differences and, and how you integrate the two in an mm -hmm. appropriate manner. So, code mesh is awesome because it allows you to kind of mesh two languages, like African American language and Standard American English, at the same time. So, versus having to stick with one, you can kind of mesh the two together. Where your students, where your sentence can start off with, you know, African American language and shift to Standard American English. And we see again Smitherman, and I'm going to use this example with part of Kendry's work. But we see Kendra, um, Smitherman do this a lot within her introductions and her conclusions too, which is a really awesome task. So if you were writing a piece, it could be something in the, in the essence of habitual beast. Say for example, that's what you want to use for, for African American language. Dante be trying to. You can kind of finish the sentence on, but toward the end and the rest of that, you will more move toward the standard American English component. Especially if what you are writing kind of causes for that. So it, it, uh, it aligns with more of, of meshing this together. So Vershawn Young talks about this extensively and, and um, its role within writing, and not only speaking, but within writing itself. Um, and so teaching that, it is a, it's a tricky task because you, you're teaching them to, this is how you're going to start off, but you may end your sentence or end the passage. It doesn't necessarily have to be the sentence, which Young talks about this way, which is um, shift, shifting off to standard American English or AAL, whatever it is that you're making those moves. So it is, it really is a, a complicated, tricky task. Um, students within the study, they felt a little bit more comfortable with the strictly AAL and SAE, um, but the, the code meshing, but you can see them kind of shift and move toward that a little bit um, as we were concluding, but it is. It's, you, it takes time for students to get used to that. It takes time for me as a writer mm -hmm. to get used to that too. Because I'm either, I'm one way or the yeah, other right. too. So it, it is a, mm -hmm. a complicated task if that makes you know, sense to you. But that's how it is, you mesh the two in, either within a sentence or it could be a paragraph passage where one be, it begins one way in one style, the, um, it concludes within another style as well. And Vashanya has a, a co-mention, you know, that, that mm -hmm. talks to 